Welcome back for another QGIS Road to Nerdvana episode. It's been a while since I put like a proper one out. I've had a few kind of ad hoc recordings of me showing people stuff, but um, I don't know if I made them all public. So in case you're wondering why the episode numbers sort of skipped over to number 19, that might be why. Um, in this episode, I thought I would just show some interesting... Uh, tooling that's provided by this Google Earth Engine Time Series Explorer plugin. Um, so let's dive in. So just a reminder that um, this is not prepared or scripted. Uh, I have no association with the people of the plugin writer in this case as well, so, uh, or the plugin that we're showing in this case as well. So I can't speak to uh, any you know, deep technical technical questions, or what have you. Um, so I'm just going to be showing as I play around with the plugin a bit and just showing you the kinds of things you can do with it. Um, and hopefully uh, you will get some benefit from seeing that too. So what is this thing called the Google Earth Engine Time Series plugin? It's, um, it's a new plugin that's been published um, and it's on the QGIS Python plugins repository. If you search for time series or GEE, you'll find it. And um, the description is pretty short. It just says that you can use it for profiling locations. Um, and um, yeah, so there's not looking at that, not too much to, to understand what it does. But if you go to the web page, um, uh, you get a bit of a video here where, they, where they're sh showing you a walkthrough. So I'm gonna, it's in a sense kind of going to be duplicating a little bit about what they do in their video. But um, I'm just going to play around with it and see how it works with my own data. The idea of the plugin is that um, Google Earth has been building, uh, Google Earth Engine I should say, has been building up this huge archive of um, open data, open remote sensing data from Landsat, Sentinel, um, Modus, and so on. And I've always wanted to be able to kind of go and grab that data in an easy way. And I've played around on the Sentinel Hub, which is an amazing uh, site, but it's got a paywall. So, I mean, if you want to do anything serious with it, it's, uh, it's going to cost you. Um, but this seems to be a totally free way to grab data. In fact, I think the terms of service on the Google Earth Engine say that you may not use it for commercial use. So um, it's free, but in the opposite um, extreme where you may not actually create a commercial product from it, which may or may not work for you. Um, anyway, I wanted to have a play on my farm with, with the data and um, I had this idea of like creating some like long-term monitoring of the um, of the farm from remote sensing and from local sensors. So um, what I did was I just created this single yellow dot in the center of the um, of my vegetable garden, and um, I'm just going to go and pick it quickly. Um, so this one over here. Um, I'm going to make it nice and big so it's easy to see. So I created this um, point just in the middle of my vegetable garden. Um, and then I followed all the instructions for the Google Earth Engine Time Series Explorer. I'm sure there must be a shorter way to say all that. Um, and it's a bit user friendly to set it up, I would say, in that you've got to go and dive into command line and type commands, Python commands, and um, paste URLs into your browser and then agree and then the whole Google Earth Engine sign up is also um, it's not user unfriendly but it's a bit of legwork you need to do before you can actually start to use the plugin. Once you've done everything though the plugin will be installed and you'll see a panel like this and um, I haven't used all the features of the plugin so I don't know um, everything that it can do but I'm just going to show some basic things that I've been playing with. Now the first thing is that it's a doc plugin which is yeah, it can be a bit irritating because in Linux it's hard to detach the dock and then, well, on my GNOME desktop anyway, and then resize the window. So that's a bit of a pain. It's um, it's kind of like, um, yeah, I get that cross here, but I can't really resize the window. So, um, in fact, it actually undocked all my windows. So just saying in a second, um, let me just take that one dock out. See if I can resize that. 
I find docs docs are um uh, I saw the the resource handle for a brief second there. There you go. Okay. Uh, a bit of a pain to work with sometimes, but like you can see now it's always wanting to drop it into the dock it into the window somewhere. Um so I'm gonna just do that and shrink the map down again a bit. Um It's taking a long time because it's looking up <laughs> a whole bunch of data for every time I um, move the mouse or click on things, which is uh, cool, but also um, a bit time consuming. So I'm just trying to arrange this. I'm just going to take this off the screen here quickly, move that down there like that so you can see my dot, and then put that back on the screen again. Hopefully that's going to work. Cool. So what are we looking at? Is um, there's my point where I wanted to do um, some some review of this tool, and here is the list of different sensors. And for each sensor, uh, let's take Landsat for example. You can choose a sensor, and then it gives you all the different information products um, that are available for that sensor. Basically, the bands. Um, uh, you can see, for example, there's NDVI or um, pull out the red, green, and blue band, for example, whatever we want to do, near-infrared. Let's take the near-infrared band for now. And then um, you can hit refresh here, and what it's going to do is it's going to go and drill down through time, and if it's uh, Landsat, it's going to be all the way perhaps back to 19, where does it go, 19? I wonder if I can actually click on one of these points. Um, let's see, does it go all the way back to, so it goes 1996 uh, by, 1986 by the looks of things, so let's go and have a look at the Landsat mission quickly on Wikipedia, Landsat mission, um, um, And we're going to see hopefully when it was launched. So uh, 1979, it changed its name. I think that's Landsat 5 that we're looking at there. 1989. Okay, so anyway, I won't go into all the details there, but we've basically got information running back 19. 86 by the looks of things and um, what we're getting is the value at this point of the infrared um, instrument on that uh, platform um, over time and we've got a few options here to go and um, play with with the data here we can pull up the data as a as a big text file um, with all the points in time. And if you played with the temporal framework in QGIS, you might be starting to think, oh, that's cool, I could be taking this data out and then doing stuff in temporal framework, which we could be doing. So um, it's nice to look at it like this, but maybe it's also nice to have the data and that we can grab it and do things with it. So um, I'll just show some of the other options. So you can filter by date. Um, you can also uh, choose a bunch of other filtering requirements here. Uh, typically, you're going to filter by land cover, uh, by cloud cover. Um, the sampling scale is going to be sensor related, so I think Landsat is 30 meter pixels. Um, and then you can, if you've got multiple points, you link it to a point layer. Like in this case, if you've got multiple ones, you can flip through them. In my case, I've only got one dot in my point layer, but let me just digitize another dot here quickly. Um, I'm just going to go somewhere else in my farm. Let's go here by the pond. Okay. I'll put it right in the middle of the pond. I'm going to say pond. And then save our edits. So now I should be able to flip through the points. I might need to kind of reload it. Let's just take it off and put it back onto there. So again, it's it's running off and doing the query for um, 
that layer and then you can just set a, a name that or a column that shows um, uh, some information for each point basically uh, you can see this um, movement icon is enabled now so I can flip between the veggie garden and the pond whose name I didn't put in quite right but um, and I can see the infrared reflectance over time from that so infrared probably is a good indication of plant growth plant figure um, and then I could take one of those so let's go back to the veggie garden um, and let's try a different product so the NDVI is the normalized density of vegetation index and it gives you an indication of how vigorous the plant growth is and um, how leafy the plant growth is I guess you could say um, for that area um, so let's uh, take this and see what else we can do here we've got a download option let's see if we can uh, so I tried this earlier and it wasn't working it was supposed to um, download it and save it as a text file. I'm going to go and look at my um, temp folder where it was supposed to have put it. Um, so for me that's not working. I don't know um, why not but as a workaround we can go and we can click on that icon I was showing you just now here and we can grab all the data and put it into a text file like that and then save that out um, and I'm just going to save it uh, uh, let's go put it in the project folder where my other data is We're going to call this um, Landsat NDVI Veggie Garden TXT. All right, and then let's try to pull that data back in in a minute into QGIS. But first, I want to just show that there were some other options here as well. So uh, if you click on this one here, you can find. Um, um, I guess that's linked to a data point. I don't actually know why um, it would show only a single image. But there you can see the date is embedded in there. So that was an image from 1984. And I think it had a revisit time of 15 or 30 days, something like that. Um, so if we click somewhere else and we look at the image, we see that one is from uh, 1987 and so on. So you can find out for each data point like this one was exceptionally high here uh, what was happening in that year and we can see it was uh, 2001 something happened in 2001 that caused vigorous plant growth at that location and conversely here's another outlier where it was really low uh, in fact yeah let's have a look there so that was in 2005 maybe it was a really dry year um, so we've grabbed the data. We can also click on this image here, and what it will do is it will <clears throat> it will pull the image in. Um, at last time, it took us a few seconds to grab it, but it will add the image in as a as a layer in your QGIS project. Or maybe it's had an error doing it. It was working for me the other day, but let's just try one more. Oh wait, I think it's drawing something in the background. You can see it's turned it off there. Okay, so that needs to be enabled. So I think basically as you explore, it pulls the image down for you. There we go. So I'm at <laughs> a very large scale map, but there is the, there is the data. Um, 
just being pulled in dynamically. I mean, this kind of <laughs> accessibility to the uh, to Landsat data is just incredible. It's it's hard to overstate <laughs> how amazing it is that um, you can just access this whole catalog down to the pixel level and um, pull information up for any pixel over time. Um, and just anybody can do it. It really opens up a whole world of possibilities. Um, okay, and then the the other sensors you can go play around with. So um, there's all sorts of fun you can have with those as well. Um, what I want to do then is going to close this and then load that data up and see um, uh, how the data itself could be added to QGIS. So I'm going to go to uh, add a delimited text layer and then go and browse into my project folder um, um, okay now we're going to treat this as a delimited text file QGIS is already smart enough to figure everything out for me because um, I've already kind of run this workflow once before so you may need to choose some options for example the uh, the delimiters you may, might need to set it I think it's semicolon delimited but uh, anyway maybe, maybe it'll just work straight out of the box for you that would be also great um, so what we're going to get is a new point layer which is called sentinel ndvi and that point layer will be uh, more or less coincident with the um, I think it's this green one over here now, I don't know why it shifted it might have been because I, I think there's also an option to manually go and place the point on the map and when I was clicking on the map of this cross here I think it was actually doing that let's just change the map tool back to something else okay um, so there's my point and then I could put a label to that point with the NDVI level like this. Um, here. And maybe just do a little bit of placement options here. So um, put it underneath the point with a little bit of a offset and Let's put a little box behind it. Um, something like that. We'll just offset it a little bit more. I'm not trying to get too fancy here. I just want to just make sure that it's clear. And I'm going to make it the label a bit bigger as well so I'll just move that down a bit make that like eight away and then I can make the font much bigger um, I make this like 15 that's not a great font try another one Okay, cool. I'll make it even bit bigger again. Make it easy to see. There we go. All right, so that's fantastic. Now, because that data set had timestamps in it as well, we can go in here and we can go and click on the temporal option and choose a single field with a date time. And we've got the time there. And uh, let's say the time lasts for... Uh, 15 days. I think it's 15 day return time. I'm not sure, but um, let's see if that works. I'm gonna gonna open the temporal controller here. Uh, here we go, and we're gonna tell it to load the time range from the data set. So you uh, wait. Uh, that's gonna be in days. Um, I just want to go check again to see if it picked up the start and end date. Um, 
I want to look in the data set to see if I if I got if I understood everything correctly. So there's the time. Uh, let's sort it backwards. Okay, so we only got from 2017. I, I don't know why it didn't export the whole range. I'll go and have a look. Maybe it's because I chose some, changed some options right at the end. But okay, cool. But that's so that QGIS is doing the right thing there. Um, and we can put it in a loop and we can tell it to play it maybe like 15 frames per second, something like that. And uh, let's let it run and see what it does. Cool. So we can see basically a kind of a a change in time as the NDVI readings changing. There are some missing ones there. Probably we could do some clever magic to make sure that it showed the last one um, when there's nothing to read. Or we could go here and we could make this a bit faster by going to make this like 30 frames per second. That's pretty cool. And um, we can do other things as well with the data plotly plugin. We can pull that data out and put it. We got it plot from the um, uh, from the, the the plugin itself, but. With data plotly, we could go and do something a bit more customizable. So um, here, here's the Sentinel-2 NDVI layer. We can tell it to use the uh, plot time over ND, uh, NDVI over time, and um, create a plot like that. And um, I can't remember if the this plugin is temporally enabled yet but um, in this case we don't really want it to do um, let's put it like that um, and then we can create ourselves a nice plot again of um, that data set that we've downloaded so really amazing that uh, you know just all the empowerment we get from uh, both the plugin and obviously Q just uh, as a platform that we can Go and be now <laughs> pulling uh, archived data set data from Landsat, and in a few minutes whipping up a, a chart which shows um, uh, the history of uh, plant vigor over time. Just make that a bit bigger like that. So yeah, so that's kind of what I wanted to show, just how you could play around with um, with uh, the Google Earth. Engine Explorer, Time Series Explorer plugin, and uh, Data Plotly, and uh, will and create some cool visualizations um, showing uh, you know change in, in plant vigor over time. Um, really amazing uh, technology just right on your on your fingertips. I think I'll stop there and uh, hopefully you go and have a play and tell me what interesting use cases you might come up with. And I'm sure the developers of, uh, um, of the Earth, uh, Google Earth, en <laughs> Earth Engine Time Series Explorer plugin would uh, love to hear your comments and thank you to them and also to the Data Plotly authors for the great um, great tools. It's really so, so amazed that you could be doing this. Um, I'd love to see what you get up to. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll catch you next time.